Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us on another episode of Calvary Conversations. My name is Mariah and I'm here with my dad, Pastor Craig Roders. What's up? Today we have a very special guest who is the assistant pastor at Calvary Chapel San Jose with Pastor Mike McClure. They are being fined $2 million for being fully open and $30,000 each personally. And we're going to be talking about today how churches need to stand up for the truth. It's my honor and privilege to welcome Pastor Carson Atherley. Carson, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. Great to be with you. Yes, and we are thankful to have you here with us and to share what's happening at Calvary Chapel San Jose. So before we get started, Dad, do you want to pray for us? Yeah. Father, I just thank you so much for your love. I thank you that uh, um, you said in your word that woe to you when all men speak well of you like they did the false prophets. So, Father, thank you that Carson and his pastor, Mike, they're going through it. Mm -hmm. And that means that they're standing up for you, Lord. And so, Father, we thank you. Like Peter and uh, Peter and John said, praise God, that uh, we are worthy to be beaten for the sake of Christ. They haven't been beaten but they've definitely been beaten up politically and uh, by the by the government. And so we just pray that you will just bless them, protect them. Thank you that it seems like you have really provided for them, even though there is some uh, threat of fines and uh, on the church and them personally. But I just pray that you'll give them strength, give them boldness. And we just ask that you'll just bless this time. And uh, we commit it to you as your word says, whatever you commit to the Lord, it shall be established. We pray that this would be this podcast would encourage many to step up and be bold. And mm -hmm. because if we don't, then the government will. I, I love what uh, one man of God said, that if you want the government to meet all your needs and take care of you, housing, schooling, everything, then it, and you want it to basically be your provider, then it'll demand to be worshiped as God. And so, Lord, we want you to be God, not the government. We thank you for the government when it does what it's supposed to do, but not when it encroaches in freedom of religion. And so, Father, we just pray You'll really speak through Carson to really tell us what's going on and uh, what we should be praying for and what we should mm -hmm. be concerned about is other churches. As Charlie Kirk said, that so many people don't care because, hey, it's not happening to me. But let us realize it could happen to all of us in America. And so, Father, help us to stand strong and do what's right in your eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So before we get started, just letting everyone know this is a conversation, so we are just going <laughs> to be able to talk. Yeah. And... Um, and we also want, Carson, for you to share who you are and kind of what you do at Calvary Chapel San Jose and also what's going on right now with your church. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm an assistant pastor here at Calvary Chapel San Jose. Uh, my wife, Megan, and I, and we have an 11-month-old daughter named Ivy as well. Oh, cool. I'll throw that in there for sure. <laughs> yeah. but my yeah. wife and I have the privilege of overseeing uh, the youth ministry, so that's junior high and high school, and we also oversee the young adults, 18 to 28-year-olds, and do a multitude of other things around the church, Any really anything that's needed. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a privilege to serve here. We've been here for um, just under two years. As I mentioned, I was sent out here by Pastor Ken Graves, Calvary Chapel Central, Maine. So I'm a long way from home. We're on the other side of the country, over here on the left coast. Um, I'm from a very, yeah, a very rural, um, just very... Um, very conservative, very stoic <laughs> state of being. <laughs> yeah. living, Google uh, all those snow. guys are real conservative, right? <laughs> exactly. And I'm coming all the way out here to uh, a different world. Um, is Maine my pretty conservative? Because I've never been to Maine. Yeah. It's, I'm from Syracuse, Maine, so sort of. Yeah. But is it pretty conservative? For time, yeah, for a long time it was very conservative, uh, but it's starting to become a, a mini California, unfortunately. Oh, wow. Um, Pastor Ken Graves and the, the church there, Calvary Chapels there, are dealing with a pretty tyrannical, wicked uh, governor, a, a woman named Janet Mills. So uh, Pastor Ken actually right now um, just filed at the Supreme Court um, uh, against Governor Mills. So that's who I am. My wife's actually from the state of California. She's from Oakland. So it's like she she's coming home. But for me, again, it's as, as far away from home as possible. Um, and so, yeah, we've been here for just under two years. Um, obviously, everything just to kind of somewhat summarize what's gone on thus far. Um, we opened the doors on May 31st for everyone to come back inside. No restrictions, no masks, no social distancing, singing, stuff like that. Uh, and shortly thereafter, that's when Santa Clara County came to the facility and came to the church and they were knocking on the door and 
served us with um, basically a, an order telling us that we need to, to stop, you know, cease and desist order. Um, obviously, we didn't comply with that order. Uh, and so shortly thereafter, after that, they started fining us. Uh, and they were fining us um, for, one, being open, and two, not submitting a social distancing protocol, which is what they want. Basically, every business, every religious institution, everyone in Santa Clara County, they want to submit a social distancing protocol, uh, which basically just says we're going to do everything that that they want. Uh, So obviously, we didn't submit that. And it started out as a $250 fine. And then every day after that, we we, didn't submit it. Uh, that fine doubled until it reached the maximum five thousand dollar a day fine. So we went from two hundred and fifty to five hundred to a thousand, two thousand, four thousand, five thousand, and then five thousand dollars every single day after that. So we accumulated fines very quickly. Yeah. Um, we we quickly passed a million and. And we, at this point in time, are at about $2 million in administrative fines, which is crazy. Hey, Carson, to ask you real quick, um, just for those that might be kind of more liberal slant or churches are saying, why don't you just comply? Hmm. What would you say to that of like when you said, hey, we opened up on May 31st, you said, and why wouldn't you just comply? You know, you know, people, you know this, right? Uh, Romans 13, obey the governing authorities. What What's your stance on that or your church's stance of why you felt that you— uh, felt the liberty to say, um, you know, we respect the government, but the government doesn't have the right to tell us not to to meet sure. together. So what would you say to that? Well, I mean, we, we mentioned a little bit before this, you know, Hebrews ten twenty five. there's a clear command in Scripture to not forsake the assembling together of ourselves, as is the manner of some. Yeah. But as we see the day of the Lord approaching, we should be doing it all the more. You know, it's a command in Scripture to gather together, to come together. That's what the church is. Uh, also, again, like you said, I've heard many people talk about about Romans, you know, mm-hmm. submit, submit to the government. But it's clear, if you look at the context there, that government is supposed to do two things. They're supposed to promote what is good, and they're supposed to punish what is evil. Mm-hmm. And that's the exact opposite of what's happening here. They're punishing what is good, and they're promoting what is evil. And the church is a hospital. Mm-hmm. You know, we have people who just need... Um, they need fellowship. They need interaction with other people. They need interaction with their church family. Uh, and so we're, we're a hospital. We're not going to turn any individual away. So that's what I would say to that. That's why we know that we have, and not to mention, of course, the Constitution as well. That's the yeah. supreme law. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so for all of those reasons, yeah. we opened our doors, and, and we're going to continue to keep them open. Amen. That's good. And we, I like what Rob McCoy said, how it's like they're supposed to work for us, right? It's mm-hmm. not They're not kings. Right. To, with their the government of the people by the people, so it's like they're supposed to work for us, so they don't get to you know it's kind of like I don't hear I don't know if you want to get into this, but I like Biden where he says if you guys are good, then you can meet on uh, July fourth for 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 Fourth of July, but if yeah. not, mandates could be it's like well thanks King Biden you know that's so nice that you right. let us meet you know but uh, anyway it's like I laugh with people like we you know people are meeting now right I mean it's not like they're not, yeah. You know. But anyway. yeah. And for those who don't know, like, what do the mandates look like in California? Well, especially back in 2020, but how strict were they for you guys? Yeah, in- incredibly strict. Um, I know that there are, f- I believe, four or five states who are considered uh, red states, which means they have the most severe and and um, harsh of all all the states in terms of restrictions. Uh, one of them is actually the state of Maine, where I'm from. I think another one was New York, another one was New Jersey, and then California. And out here, it was was uh, it was I mean, just terrible. I mean, you couldn't go out, you know, outside seating for eating, inside seating for for uh, for eating at restaurants. All, all the churches were closed down. You weren't allowed to have any sort of uh, indoor gathering. Um, uh, in terms of the church, unless, specifically unless, to the church. Unless you're the governor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Unless you're the governor, right? <laughs> you can do whatever you want. Good for thee, but not exactly. for me, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's rules for thee and not for me. <laughs> yeah. uh, and yeah. we, you know, we've caught him and a lot of these other liberal governors who have been violating their own restrictions that they've instituted. So, um, you know, unfortunate to see. Um, but in terms of the church specifically, I mean, really, there's five things that they're they're unhappy about. One, that we're inside. They don't want us to be inside. Two, that we're not limiting the capacity. They want to tell us how many people we can have inside. Uh, three, we're not requiring face masks. 
uh, four, we are singing. Mm. Uh, and then the fifth one, let me see here, inside, not limiting capacity, not wearing face masks, not, oh, we're, we're singing, and then social distancing. Mm-hmm. They want us to be socially distanced. So we're not in compliance with, with any of those things, and so that's really why they're, they're upset. So that's what the restriction looks like. They're, they're looking at those five things yeah. when it comes to the church. Yeah, and it's so sad because you see this going on, and then you see people who call themselves Christians, but we say they're more woke Christians, and say, why don't you just comply? Why don't, like my dad was saying, and another reason too is because we know that we're supposed to defend and speak the truth, and a lot of times we're realizing that, especially when you're talking about Hebrews 10, 25, especially as the day of the Lord approaches, and we see that. We see that we are in the last days. I mean, everyone has their eschatology, but we believe that it's going to get bad and the Lord's going to take us home with him. But <laughs> so many people, I think they just give up. They're like, okay, if I believe that, right, if they're pre-trib, they, okay, well, let's just let it happen and God will come back for us. <laughs> but like we've been talking about, we talked to Pastor James Cadiz. It's like, we don't want to hear you wicked and lazy servant. Amen. We're going to stand for truth until, you know, until the Lord yeah. does take we us home. Whether we say, I think Jack Hibbs says, rupture or rapture we're gonna stand for truth so we've been seeing you guys do that and um can you tell us a little bit about maybe some testimonies or things of why it is so important that you guys are fully open and that you guys are not complying to what they're saying and that you are just really obeying the commands of god yeah um a lot of testimony that i could give you i mean the lord has certainly poured out his spirit since may 31st and we've been open um, a couple of things. One, I mean, we have people in tears every single Sunday morning who are coming to the church just saying, it has been so long since I have been in fellowship, since I have seen my brothers and sisters in Christ. Cool. I've been able to worship with them, sing songs of praise to the Lord, and open up His Word and hear from Him. There are people in tears every single Sunday morning, and I can't, uh, I mean, there's been so many people too who said, I would be dead. Hmm. I would be dead. I would have killed myself if you guys hadn't had your doors open because every other church in our area essentially is closed. And so it's been, like I said, such a refuge and such a hospital for so many people. Uh, Pastor Mike makes it a point every Sunday morning also to invite people to, to accept Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, to surrender to his Lordship. And there have been, I mean, just countless people every single Sunday morning just raising their hand, wanting to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. And we've had a couple baptism services. We've had three, and we've baptized uh, about 150 people. And, and so it's just, I mean, these are just some of the, the many testimonies of just why it's so important that the doors of the church are open. Mm-hmm. The, the kind of the cool thing I see, Carson, I don't know if you would agree with it, but it's sort of neat to me, at least in our area in Tucson, that it's so many of the liberal churches are complying. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of like we're getting people that normally <laughs> would never darken the door of a Calvary or at least start church. And so it's sort of cool how they're kind of shutting down. Now it's sad because they're big denominations. They probably hold on, but it's neat that our church has sort of been growing and probably yours, like you said too, but it's neat to see that people coming in the doors that normally wouldn't probably never think about coming, but because we're the only right. game in town or one of the only yeah. games in town. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. We've had a lot yeah. of Catholic people. We had a Catholic guy who was really cool who, who came, he's older, he's like 70 something. And he, uh, received Christ, it seemed like. I mean, I'm not for sure, but he really said he liked it. I'm an, I'm an ex-Catholic from New York. And, and so, and then he died like three weeks later. And so it was really cool that he, you know, um, he, his uh, son goes here. Mm-hmm. So it was really neat. So not that he died, but it was neat that he experienced the Lord right. and heard mm-hmm. the gospel. So, um, so yeah, so those are cool. I mean, I like, I kind of, how do I say it? I don't like what COVID's doing in the sense of like trying to shut down. But it's neat how it's sort of shut down a lot of the liberal churches yeah. and sort of right. given a way to the true church to stand up and be a, yeah. a light in the darkness. Yep. Absolutely. The churches that are standing upon God's word are the ones that are open. Yeah. Uh, and it's waking and people been... up, too. It's waking people up who maybe were <clears throat> lukewarm. We're seeing that a lot, especially with kids, because, you know, like working with youth with your wife, like so many kids because not having school. And it's probably way worse in California and just the suicide rates, those have gone up. And just being able to have these kids, like, be able to go to youth group, be able to spend time with other godly Christian friends, like, how important that is. Can you share just what you've seen and some stories of how important that is for the youth at your church? 
Yeah, I mean, it's been absolutely incredible. I mean, our, our youth group, just this last Friday, I had Pastor Ken Graves actually share because he was here. And we had about 100 junior hires and high schoolers where previously, before COVID, we had about 30 to 40. Yeah. So there's just, I mean, there's so many youth in our community here in Santa Clara County in the, in the greater San Jose area who, again, like we've been talking about, just want fellowship, want to worship the Lord, want to open His Word. And so, um, I mean, so many kids who are, we're struggling right now in our community with suicide, with depression, anxiety, and also, I will tell you this, with all the students being online for school, tremendous you know, pornography mm-hmm. addiction because they're on their computers all day long. And so these kids, I mean, they need to be cared for, tended to, and they need God's Word. So um, it's been awesome to see all the students come many from different churches, different backgrounds, um, different, you know, different home lives, everything like that. And just see the new friendships that have been forming, new relationships, uh, and see all these students who are just eager to open up God's word and hear from him. It's been absolutely incredible and a privilege of mine to be a part of it. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I think, I think the scripture, I believe what is Romans uh, five twenty, where sin abounds or iniquity abounds, Amen. grace abounds much more. And it's so neat to see how God's using this hard thing or bad thing, whatever you want to call it, for good to those that really love him. And so it's really cool. And and I like that you also talked about and shared how it's, we just, we just think of like the things of depression, suicide, but I like that you brought up pornography in that because so many times um, that's not just happening with kids, adults, everyone, not just happening with men, women too has gone up like drastically. And so I think it's just important for us to remember that when the Bible talks about in, in James, confess your sins to one another so that you might be mm-hmm. healed. That's so powerful, that confession and that accountability and getting help. Because so many kids, I've been realizing because with us having youth group, my brother and I lead it, we just see that there are so many kids that are just hurting and they want to like share what's going on, but they don't know who to talk to. They feel like they can't talk to the parents, right? Because they're busy with um, their job and with every, all the craziness with covid so they're kind of neglected. And so it's cool being able to, we always joke, it doesn't take a, a village to raise a child. It takes a church. Like mm-hmm. I, the family, how important it is for not only the mom, right? Because we always see the moms bringing the kids to church, but the fathers to stand up and say, hey, we're going to church this Sunday, even though I'd rather, you know, not go. And I think it was, um, I think it was your pastor, Pastor Mike McClure, but they're talking about how if you just stop like one Sunday, oh, hey. COVID's happening. We can't meet. Well, let's let's do online services together. Let's watch it. And then the kids go in the kitchen, he was saying. And then, oh, hey, let's go watch a movie or something. And then you find out that it's just you're not going at all. And so right. that's why it's so important for the fathers to stand up and for the kids to not only get involved, but for the fathers to maybe ask their kids, like, hey, how are you doing? Are you struggling with this? Like, how can I help you maybe hold you accountable? So for you, how do right. you see how important that is? Um for the men to stand up. Yeah, it's so important. Like you said, most people don't have the discipline to turn on, you know, church on their computer, on their TV screen, and actually sit down and watch it. I mean, it's, one, it's just not the same. People zone out in church. I'm thinking, what do you do if you're on your couch? Yeah. You know? It's like uh, watching a fireplace online. You know, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have the same. It's the same, but not really, and it doesn't have any of the heat no warmth, or the warmth. Yeah. Yeah. And so most people don't have the discipline to do that, to sit down and actually even watch the full service. And I believe it was Barna Research who said that a whole third of people who went online and just started doing the whole online thing are completely gone now. They're gone. They're not even going to church in person or online. They're just gone. Uh, And so it's so important that dads bring bring not only their kids but their whole family. Men, you know, men really are the the pastors of their home, you know, priests of their home. So they need to really step up and take charge, uh, and and really just um, you know again bring their kids, bring their wives, bring their families to church and guard just the spiritual well being of their families. And we've seen a lot of men here doing that. So it's been really encouraging. Yeah, I forget I did. Uh, for a Father's Day message, but I forget, maybe you know the stat better than me, but it said like if a man 
a father is excited about God, the kid's chances of loving God is like 80%. But if just mom loves God and the father's like, eh, whatever, then they only have about a 20 right. something percent chance of loving God. So that's how much it's amazing. Sadly, how the women are usually a lot of times, sadly in this modern day are kind of the leaders for going to church and stuff. But it really, I always speak that we need to, as men step up and really say, Hey, no, God is a priority. God's important. And as you're saying too, you know, think about it as like, you know, what does it mean to gain the whole world and lose your soul in the strife? It's like, what does it mean to have perfect health? Yeah. But like you're saying, suicide, sexual morality, and you might live, you know, 20, 30, 40 years because you have no risk of COVID possibly, mm. but yet you you die spiritually because you fell away from God or you're living in blatant sin or, you know, I mean, whatever. And, you know, I always think, like you said, we were talking online about the hypocrisy, right? I think Fauci said, you know, it's all right to hook up on Tinder mm. and, uh, and uh, what's the other word? Grind. Right. But, you know, but keep your mask. And so I'm like, isn't that kind of a connection there? <laughs> and I was just, it's just insane. And like strip clubs, and, you know, yeah. casinos, just you know, it's Marijuana. like the Isaiah five, you know, you know, you know, good will be called evil, evil will be called good, and it's just everything's backwards in this modern day. So Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then um so you just had a conference, uh it, it was a men's conference. It was with Ken Graves, um, was Don McClure, uh Pastor Wal Reese, and then your pastor Mike McClure. But um can you share just what that was about? And I know the main verse was Joshua one nine talking about being strong and courageous so hopefully you're listening so just kidding um, <laughs> yeah, he but he's like i was running i was running that i'm tired of listening uh, but yeah. what was like what are the things that stood out to you um just even what your pastor ken graves was saying and that stuff too of just men standing up and what does that look like and do you think ken should be a little more manly because he's ken <laughs> yeah, he's how you doing <laughs> I love that. I'm not good. yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was talking about testosterone levels in <laughs> you know America today and how it's <laughs> yeah. He said they're so much lower than in times yeah. past, and and one of past other pastors on staff came to him and said, "You want to know why testosterone levels are so much lower in, in you know the culture around us? Because you have all the <laughs> yeah, testosterone." You took it yeah, yeah, and they, and I think also too the skinny jeans because it's like making everything so tight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, I don't, how does Rob McCoy wear skinny jeans? I don't understand that. You know, he's such a good guy. And he wears skinny jeans. Yeah, yeah. still be friends with Pastor Ken. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ken, I, I'm sure I know Charlie dogs him, so I bet you Ken must dog him too. So, <laughs> yeah, the conference was was awesome. I mean, we had about 400 men there, uh, and it was all about you know you know being being strong and courageous. Joshua one nine, like like you said, and it was our our theme verse there, and. Um, uh, actually, Pastor Rawl unfortunately wasn't able to make it. Um, you probably know Pastor Rawl has seizures, uh, and so he just had a seizure the day before, uh, and so was pretty weak and, and not able to come. So continue to lift him up in prayer. Um, he's he's on the mend right now. So uh, what we did is we had um, actually Marcus McClure, Pastor Mike's brother and Pastor Don's son. He actually shared his testimony in place of their. Pastor Wall would be speaking. And so that was awesome. And, and actually, Marcus shared his testimony and the importance of being a godly man within your household, like we were just talking about, and, and a godly father and a godly husband. So he did an awesome job. Um, but Pastor Ken and, and and Pastor Don both shared on on very, uh, you know, different things. Uh, Pastor Ken was talking about Acts chapter 9. He was talking about, about Saul, you know, on the road to Damascus and how five things were evident with uh, in, in Saul's life. And, and in that story in Acts chapter 9, uh, there are five R's. You know, he came to the revelation of who Jesus Christ was and what he had done. You know, that, that bright light shone, brought him to, you know, you know, brought him to his knees, you know, took him off of his feet, and he, he, he came to the revelation of who Jesus Christ is and what he had done. And with that, there was this realization of his duty. He asked, what do you want me to do, Lord? You know, and likewise, we have a duty to God. What is it? Uh, there was also reliance upon the Holy Spirit. He was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, there was uh, repetition of daily disciplines. It says that that Saul he increased all the more in strength, mm. and then finally relationships with other people. So there are these five R's that Pastor Ken talked about, and how they should be evident in our lives if we're going to be courageous men of God. Uh, and then Pastor Don was in um, ha ha Habakkuk, and he was sharing on basically just the turmoil of the nation, everything that was going on, the unraveling of the nation, and all the, the things that were happening. 
and how Habakkuk, he, he really, he was, um, you know, he was, he was distressed. He was fretting. He was like, Lord, how, you know, what do you see everything that's going on around me in this nation? You know, everything is falling apart. Lord, what is going on? And he perceived that the Lord, that, that the Lord wasn't speaking to him. He wasn't even, he wasn't listening to him. He's like, Lord, do you see what's going on? Everything that's happening around us, the nation is just unraveling much like you know, people today are saying, do you see what's going on in our nation today? Everything is falling apart. Everything is unraveling. And the Lord says that he's actually going to accomplish everything that he needs to through the Chaldeans. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, Habakkuk is obviously even more confused by mm -hmm. that. Why are you going to use our enemies, these, these wicked people, uh, you know, to, to judge us? And how, how is this even going to work? All these things. He just he was completely perplexed. Um, but he came to the realization that he really didn't he didn't really need to know every little detail as long as he knew that God was is sovereign, he's in control and he's yeah. gonna work everything out. So um, that's what Pastor Don shared on. And then as I mentioned, you know, Marcus shared his testimony. So that, that was kind of the things that were shared with the men this last weekend. That's what that's what I was saying this Sunday, how you know, all of us, of course, I mean I'm pretty sure you would say we wanted, you know, Trump's not perfect, but we wanted Trump as president. But yet I really see that sometimes, you know, when we have someone like Trump who kind of, you know, cares about the church, seems like, and yet we get compliant or complacent, we get kind of relaxed. And it's sort of like when we see Biden and, and all the restrictions and everything, it sort of has awoken the true church to say, hey, wait a sec, we need, and I don't know about you, but I've seen kind of a surge. So I kind of said in a way, you know, give thanks for all things. I'll say, I don't really like Biden's policies. I don't like that he's not really there. But I like that it's sort of awakened the church to say, oh, my goodness, we can't be asleep at the wheel. We need to occupy. We need to be praying. We need to be speaking up. We need to be standing up for righteousness. And we need to be willing, as you know better than most, we need to be willing to be persecuted or have uh, consequences for standing up for truth. And that is I, so I see this. Yes, you know, the Romans eight twenty eight. God works all things together for good to those who love him are called. That even though what's happened to you is not technically good, but God is working it for good for you and for many other people, right? Kind of yeah. get, giving you some prominence and also being a lighthouse to those that are really hurting that, like you said, would have probably committed suicide if you guys hadn't been there. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. yeah. And I love like we can talk about too God's sovereignty because I think so many people – go to extremes they either are like they believe oh god is sovereign but we have no free will or they believe oh we have free will but they kind of just spit on god's sovereignty but especially with calvary well, it's all, right it's, like we, we're, it's all up to us they kind of we have people yeah. that say you didn't pray hard enough you that's why pray, trump yeah. isn't president and we're like come on yeah. you know give me a break you know, yeah so. and so that's why yeah. we see that where we can relax right. is like oh sorry no, I was just saying, I apologize. Strike the balance, right? Striking the exactly. balance. That's a exactly. And the only way we can find the balance is the Holy Spirit. And I think people forget right. that. They think that, oh, we can do the, kind of get the balance in our own strength, you know. Mm -hmm. And we do believe that God is sovereign, but we also have free will. We can't just say right. that, oh, we have nothing to do. <laughs> and so we were just talking to Pastor James Cadiz about that, about saying, you know what? Like so many times people say, oh, well, then you guys must be dominionist if you guys think we have to like get in there and stand for truth and it's like <laughs> we're not saying that but we're also saying we shouldn't give up when the bible tells us to stand firm we're going to stand firm and we're not doing it in our own strength right because we can do nothing in our own strength but we're doing it by the strength and the power of the holy spirit so that's what leads us into the balance so Carson, when you say that balance, what would you say of that? I mean, I don't want to put you too weird of Calvinist Arminism, but it's funny how we have this guy. What's his name? It's up in Phoenix. Um, Jeff Durbin. Jeff Durbin, who's a hardcore Calvinist. Really, he's kind of like a. He's a cool. Got a. Is that a, a yeah. Paul Gia yeah, church? Paul Gia. That, so he's yeah. really hardcore Calvinist, preterist. But he is basically saying his indictment subtly to people like us who believe in a pre-trib rapture is you guys kind of like, hey, Jesus, take the real, you know, give up, let it cra let the car crash. And so, um, but then there, he said, which I think is crazy, he goes, we're winning, guys. We're winning the culture. And I'm going, how can you say you're winning, you know, that you're, you're rocking? I mean, praise God, he is going to the abortion yep, clinics. He's doing amazing things. But what, what would you say, since you're in the heat of it, of like you said, strike the balance, what would you say to the people that, you know, kind of because he would be more of a dominionist, we're going to usher in the kingdom, but Calvary's more of, hey, we know it's going to get worse before it gets better, 
but yet we're not supposed to, right? We agree we're not supposed to be apathetic and let go. We don't want to be the wicked. Where's your kind of take on the balance in that situation? You know, and, and I mean, kind of how do we occupy, yeah. but yet we know things are going to get worse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the bottom line is um, those aren't mutually exclusive mm-hmm. things, you know, where, where sometimes they're treated that way. Like, you know, either God is sovereign or, you know, the responsibility of man. It's either or no, it's both. And because we see both in Scripture, mm-hmm. we teach both. God is sovereign. That means just simply to possess supreme or ultimate power and authority. He is all powerful. But we absolutely have responsibility in and of ourselves. So that, you know, you, to deny one is to deny, you know, part mm-hmm. of Scripture. And, um, and so, yeah, we know ultimately how things are going to play out in the end. The Lord has the, the final say, but still that doesn't negate our responsibility and our duty. That's clearly outlined in, in the word of God. We have to take a stand. Amen. And so, you, what would you base? I mean, Carson, in the sense of where, you know, cause some people have a pre-trib rapture, uh, that they kind of say, Hey, you know, we kind of want it to get bad. We kind of want to Biden. How would you, what's, what scriptural premise would you use to say why you guys are really saying no you know we know it's we know eschatology we know that it's going to get worse but we need to keep trying to restrain evil trying to speak truth trying to step up how what motivates you to say even though you know with your eschatology of calvary that we're that it, things are going to get worse before they get better right that's why we're going to need to be raptured because right before for once the restrainer's gone but how do you what motivates you to say when you got he said personal fines up to a couple you know what is it 27,000 27 yeah so i mean you're a young man so that's that's a pretty good hit for you right i don't think you probably have 500,000 in the bank so it's like that's that's pretty intense so what motivates you besides of course jesus but what scriptures could you encourage others that maybe are thinking ah you know just who am i why should i get involved why should i risk like carson being fined these huge fines that could pretty much make life pretty hard for you well i'd say the parable of talents is a great one where the master gives talents to some of his servants comes back and he basically just there's a there's a day of reckoning you know what i mean there's a there's a point where he calls each of those servants before him and says what did you do with with what i gave you and obviously we know how it went for two of them the other one you know he just took the took it buried it in the dirt and didn't do anything with it and he said you know you wicked and slothful servant you know and so I don't. That's certainly one scripture that motivates me. Darkness, you know, the Lord had yeah. sort, sort of scared. Yeah. yeah, right. So that's that's one. You know, one that I can just think of right off the top of my head: the parable of the talents, where uh, just such a responsibility, like you said, to occupy until He comes, not to just sit back and just do nothing, but to really take a stand and obey the Word of God. So that's parable of talents is Amen. clear one, Amen. clear example. And yeah. um, also, could you share what? What is it looking like for you guys right now? Are you still going to court? Is that finished? Or um, And how was it, too, when you would go? Because I saw some videos of you and Pastor Mike McClure going to court. How, what was that like for you? Uh, yeah, so, um, I mean, it was it's kind of surreal. You never, th- you know, you never, I never thought I'd ever be there. And, and in this position, especially in America, you know, it's just a sad time in American history. But um, it was... Uh, I can just tell you that the gospel is being heard, you know, and praise the Lord for that. You know, the judges heard the gospel, the enforcement officers have heard the gospel, the, you know, the county attorneys have heard the gospel, everybody outside the courthouse has heard the gospel, and that's ultimately what we want, you know. Um, I'm not even praying for or just favorable outcomes. Lord, please, I just pray that this would go away and that we'd win. It's not how we're praying here. We're praying that the Lord's will would be done, and maybe that is for us to continue to go to court, and, and in doing so, more people are going to get to hear the gospel. Like I said, since all of these court dates, court hearings have, have come come up and, you know, we've been summoned to court and everything's gone, we've had more people coming to the church than ever before. We've had more people than ever before receiving Christ. So we, you know, we just want the Lord's will to be done in all of this. Um, right now where we stand, like I said, we have $2 million in administrative fines against the church. And then Pastor Mike and I both have about $30,000 in personal fines. Um uh, it's actually a $1,500 violation every time we're at the church. Every time they see us there open, it's a $1,500 violation for us personally. Um, last month, uh, at the beginning of last month, uh, we had a court date where the judge basically said, um, I'm going to uphold all of the administrative fines against the church, and then I'm going to 
right now temporarily suspend all of your personal <laughs> fines. And those personal fines will go away if by uh, February 19th you guys comply completely to what Santa Clara – Santa Clara County is asking, and if you submit a full social distancing protocol. Well, February 19th, we're coming up on, on a month. It's been a month since February 19th, uh, and we did not do that. We did not comply, and we did not submit a social distancing protocol. So um, we're just waiting to be summoned back to court, but, but it's a little strange. It's been a month, and we still have heard nothing from Santa Clara County. We've heard nothing from the judge. It's just been silent, so I don't really know what's but going on. Do you think on. it's just they're trying uh, to just, like, you know, I don't know if you – how much you've heard of this, but back a couple of years, probably when back a long time ago, I don't know how young you are, but um, they were trying to do when it was Obama and uh, Rip, Mitt Romney were running for president and they were trying the, um, um, what do you call it? I forget. Uh, Lions defending freedom was trying to get pastors to do a thing of, of uh, to speak about the government and to try to get the Johnson amendment gone. And they were saying that they'll intimidate, they'll do all these mm -hmm. fines, they'll do all these things, but they've never taken one to court yeah. because they said if they went to court, they'd be able to prove it's unconstitutional. It's violating our first amendment, right? Right. A free speech. But, you know, so anyways, so do you think, I mean, what's your feeling? I don't know if you have liberty to say, but is it just, it's, it seems like it's just intimidation to comply, right? I mean, they're kind of saying, hey, just do this. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, kind of a tyrannical thing. We're going to try to just intimidate you so you will comply and obey. Yeah. Yeah. My opinion is, I mean, all the other churches in the area, they just capitulated immediately. They were served a cease and desist order, or maybe they got one fine and they said, okay, you know, we'll shut our doors. And so they were anticipating that that would happen with us. We'll, we'll give them a cease and desist order. Well, that didn't work. So 5,000. And then they just, the fines kept going, kept going, kept going. And then they recognized, all right, you know, this intimidation, what they thought was going to work, it's not working. You know what I mean? So we got to pivot. Now, not only are we going to find the church, but let's find Pastor Mike, let's find Carson, let's find them personally, individually. And then, so they're just, it's one level of intimidation to another. They're just trying to intimidate. Um, but what they don't realize is that we're, we're willing to die on this hill. You know, we're, we're, we're not, we're not going to close the doors of the church. We're not going to capitulate like all the other churches have in the area or basically all the other churches. And I would anticipate that the silence over the last month probably has to do with the recent Supreme Court precedent where they did say in Santa Clara County, you can't have 25 percent inside. So I'm sure that they're trying to figure out their next strategy. How are they going to work around that? And they're probably just deliberating right now. But that's probably why. You know, Steve quiet. Carson is how you're, you're getting to live, you know, the scripture where it says, you know, don't worry about what you'll say when you stand before the magistrate, that you're getting to live that. And then you're getting to be bold. I mean, you know, have you felt, I mean, how do I say this? But have you felt kind of the Lord's giving you boldness, giving you that strength to kind of really stand? Because it's amazing how, you know, me looking at you, I'm going, $27,000. You know, you can feel a little bit like, whoa. But it's amazing how God gives you grace Amen. in the midst of that. And have you felt that kind of that supernatural strength or gri grace gifting to where you're going wow you know, this, is pretty, this is pretty yeah exactly you feel the beard poof, coming out like it's spongebob no but i mean <laughs> we're but have you kind of felt that can you kind of share not to be too super spiritual but where you felt kind of like because i'm sure at times you think okay i'm a young man i got a young family and i got twenty seven thousand or almost thirty thousand dollars of personal fines i mean that could be not a cool day for you if they really tried to enforce that right i mean how, how, how do you how do you yeah. handle that spiritually? You know what I mean. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, I mean, the Lord has certainly flooded my wife and I's hearts with with supernatural yeah. peace. And and I can tell you, it's not a it's not a feeling, but it's what I know. And what I know is what God has promised in His Word. And so uh, He again, He's promised to to work all things out for the good of those who love Him, called according to His purpose. There's a million different different pieces of scripture that I could give you, but I know what God has said in his word. And so that gives me peace, you know? And so, um, yeah, I really haven't even, I don't really, I don't think about the fines. I'm, I'm able to just go about my day doing what the Lord's called me to do. And just, again, just really giving me and my family, just, just supernatural peace in all of this. And I know the same goes for pastor Mike. We're just going about our business, doing what the Lord has, has called us to do and, you know, kind of come what may. Um, but yeah, it's been, uh, yeah, it, I, it really is supernatural peace. There's no other way to describe it. It's been absolutely awesome. Um, it's been one of the greatest privileges of my life to be able to go through this at this time. So I'm so thankful for it. Have, have they ever threatened to bring police there to actually stop people from coming in? 
Uh, no, they haven't. And, and we actually know there. Are, we know many law enforcement um, right here in San Jose who said unconstitutional mm-hmm. orders. We will never enforce. In fact, we have a lot of police officers from here in San Jose who come to church to worship the Lord and to open his word. So it's pretty awesome. It's it's funny because a a news reporter called me a couple weeks ago and said, is there a police presence at your church? Is there a police presence? You know, obviously implying, are there police there to shut you guys down? I said, yes, there's a heavy (laughs) police presence here. And they're all here to worship the Lord. They're all here. And that's pretty cool for them because (laughs) they're risking right retribution for that, right? I mean, if someone saw them, right? Absolutely. Police officers are here. Uh, workers from Santa Clara County are here. Uh, you know, it's just it's it's been amazing. Yeah, but people people have counted the cost who are coming to church here. They have counted the cost because they know they could be fined. They know. I mean, it says it. I mean, they post all these yeah, papers all, all, all over, over your, our all over the glass, right, on the front of your church. Yep, all over the glass. You can yeah. hardly see inside, and it says right on there that that you know it's you could be it's a restraining order. So if you're if you're found on property for a worship service, you could be fined. So everybody who's coming here for any of our services, events, anything has counted the cost. And I love the, that. the king that's good could put for... you in the dungeon. Yeah, but I love that too because that's encouragement for our people who are in Tucson where we don't have as much of those restrictions. So all those people, if those people in California are going out. We yeah. definitely should in Tucson. Yeah. And we're praying that we're not praying for, I love this saying, we're not praying for a lighter load, but we're praying for stronger shoulders. We're praying that God will give us more strength. And we know he will. And we also pray, it talks about if you if you need help, like in James, ask for wisdom and he'll give that to you. So I'm sure that's what you guys are praying for constantly too, just for wisdom, but not compromise, right? And praying also that um, you continue to, Say, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. Because so many times we can think we make our own plans, but again, God's sovereignty, he directs our steps. And he's definitely been doing that for you. But um, do you have any closing thoughts or anything else you would like to share before we end? Oh, well, I want to ask one thing. Just thank you. Hold one more on, question. Hold on. Then we gotta go. So is there any way besides your closing thoughts? Is You were going to say We're going to help. Oh, okay. Forward. Never mind. Listen we'll let up. you share your last thoughts. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just here for the eye candy. That's all I'm here for, Carson. <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah. Just thank, thank you guys so much for yeah. for having me on. Thank you guys for your support, for praying for us, for thinking about us. Um, because again, it it can get, um, the enemy can can lie and just say you're in it alone. You know what I mean? You're, you're one. You know, but we know that there are many other Calvary chapels, many other churches who aren't even in the Calvary Chapel movement who are standing with us. So it's such an encouragement to know there are other people who are right there with us, uh, taking a stand and um, continue just to pray for us. And, and if there's two things that I could ask you guys to pray for, it's just one, pray, like I said, that the Lord's will would be done. Mm-hmm. You know, we just we want the Lord's will to be done. That's it. We're, we have our own desires. I mean, you know, Lord, you know, if, it'd be awesome if, you know, this would all go away, but but I don't want that if it's not the Lord's will. Exactly. You know what I mean? I want the Lord's will to be done. And then second, in, in Acts chapter 4, it says, look upon their threats and grant that with all boldness your servants might speak yep. your word. That's so that's my, yeah, my other, my other prayer just for boldness. You know, we, we see all the threats. The Lord sees it. We see it. And just I, we're praying for boldness as we go before the judge again or the, the enforcement officers or, or outside the courthouse or whatever it may be. We just want boldness to share the gospel. And what's cool is remember in the scripture it says that place was shaken mm-hmm. and they were filled with the Holy Ghost boldness. You're in California, so you could either literally be shaken. <laughs> <laughs> no, That's great. <laughs> That's encouraging. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> um, did you want to sh- did, well, no. you gonna ask about the support or how? We- yeah, you ask it. I'm. Um, so, I'm is there any way that else we can help support, or where they can find your website, or if you guys have um, a YouTube channel or something like that, where we can find you? Yeah, uh, support primarily through prayer, like I said, and then also we have you know our website calvarysj.org. We're on you know YouTube. I think we we have Facebook too, even though Facebook's wicked, yeah. you know, but we have Facebook. We do the live stream, all that stuff. So as much as you can, just stay updated so you know how to pray. Um, and then also pray for Advocates for Faith and Freedom, uh, the the nonprofit uh, ministry who's representing us. Uh, and so they're doing it, like we said, pro bono, and they're working tirelessly. So also pray for, for Bob Tyler, who leads Advocates for Faith and Freedom as well. And you can go on their website if you're led to give or, or whatever. But those are some ways that you can be you know, supporting us and praying for us. Also, I'd also like to pray too, as your pastor would be a little more humble. Cause <laughs> I love the, the conference. Yeah. He goes, I'm Mike. And they're like, wait, wait. So chill. he just walked and mic drop, walked yeah. away. I'm going, man, he's such a humble dude. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I don't, I don't know him personally, but 
I've seen him. At, I've seen so him around. Thankful but thankful uh, for him too, and praying cool. for him. Yeah. But we're, my, yeah, we'll play. Tell him we love him, even though he didn't want to be on with us. It's all right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, he, is one, he is one of the most just humble uh, warriors that I've I've ever met. It's a privilege to to have him as our senior pastor. Cool. God. How did how did you get? I mean, not to be weird here, but so how did you go from from Maine to all the way across the country? I mean, how did that work out? I mean, did Ken and yeah. him were good friends, and they just swapped you, or what? <laughs> Yeah, all the Calvaries are pretty interconnected, as you know. It's like one big family all the way across the country. But he actually came out for a men's conference with General Jerry Boykin in, in Maine two and a half years ago. That's where I first was introduced to him and expressed a need out here. And Pastor Mike and him are close. And, and so he said, hey, I got a guy for you and was sent out, you know, a year and a half later. That's awesome. So you're used yeah. to just saying, here I go, am, Lord. You ever go, I wish I was in Maine. I wish I was in Maine. No, just kidding. No, just kidding. <laughs> No, you're right where god wants you yeah, to be but we'll put everything you said in the description below so everyone can check that out and carson would you like to pray for us before we end Amen. sure thank you. yeah lord thank you so much just for this opportunity lord just to to fellowship lord and to be able to speak to to people who are in a different state you know thousands of miles away lord what a privilege this is thank you lord for just um all the things that you're doing lord i thank you for what you're doing here at calvary chapel san jose and and in the church lord all across the country lord and really the world lord i pray that you would just continue lord to accomplish your will in and through our lives lord continue to use us empower us by your holy spirit lord we can't do anything in and of our own strength pray lord that you just give us boldness lord we need boldness in this time and, and moving forward lord more than ever before please give us boldness to speak clearly the truths in your word to share the gospel with a a, a sin-ridden world lord who's just headed for for hell i pray lord that we would share the message of your son jesus who who died on the cross took our place and paid the price for our sin that we can never pay lord so please help us to, to have boldness to share that message with those around us and lord we just pray that you would just continue to strengthen the church and refine the church through this season lord continue lord just to again accomplish your will in and through us lord we pray in jesus name amen thank you so much for joining us on calvary conversations if you haven't already please make sure to like subscribe and share this video if you like to listen to us wherever you get your podcast just type in calvary conversations you can also follow us on Instagram at Calvary Conversations. Purchase one of our t-shirts on Teespring in the description below. Thanks so much, guys, and God bless.